So Dean Marks, please take it away. Well, thank you very much, Melinda. I very much appreciate the uh, opportunity to do this. We have with us today Richard Carranza, alumnus of the College of Education. Richard is the superintendent of schools in the Houston Independent School District, one of the largest districts in the country. Uh, we were talking last night, and it's uh, the fourth largest city school district in the country, the seventh all overall. Uh, before uh, his uh, appointment just this year at the Houston Independent School District, uh, Richard was a superintendent at San Francisco. I had a chance to visit with him in San Francisco last year. Uh, he was superintendent there, and prior to that, he was, this is a lofty title, he was the district's deputy superintendent of instruction, innovation, and social justice. I like the innovation and social justice part of that, Richard. I do, too. Uh, a lifelong educator, uh, Richard was also the regional superintendent in Las Vegas and a high school principal right here in Tucson. And actually, that's the most important thing. He's obviously risen to the corner office, but he's an alum of the college. He's a graduate of Pueblo High School. He went back and taught at Pueblo. He then served as principal. Uh, he's a lifelong urban educator who understands the demands of urban education and the opportunities of serving our wonderful youth uh, in the Southwest. Uh, he's a national leader in education. He's past chair of the Council of Great City Schools, uh, a collaborative of, of urban school districts that serve the nation's uh, voice for urban education. He's been a spokesman about issues facing urban districts and has met with President Obama and former Secretary Arnie Duncan. Please welcome our Cat in the Corner office guest today, Richard Carranza. Thank you. Thank you. So Richard, I'm going to start off with some questions, and we'll have some coming from the audience. We'll have some coming from uh, the internet. Great. And uh, we'll have a, I have more questions that I could possibly ask, but let's get our conversation going. Uh, tell us a little about your work as superintendent of schools and the career path that led you to that work. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for being here and you know, all my friends who are family. Uh, this is truly homecoming. Um, so I, I'm just honored to be here. I'm, I'm proudly a U of A Wildcat. Uh, I've always proudly uh, trumpeted that everywhere I've been. But the career path for me to the superintendency was uh, a reluctant one. I never, ever thought I was going to be a superintendent. I was very, very happy to be a bilingual social studies teacher at Pueblo High School. I didn't want to teach anywhere else. I wanted to be at Pueblo. Uh, I was thrilled that we had the Mariachi Aslan at Pueblo High School, which I'm still so proud of, uh, of those kids and what they do. But that was, gonna, that was, that was for me, you know, applehood and mother, mother pie, motherhood and apple pie. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to be a teacher. Um, but invariably, as things happen, you know, you start seeing things. You start uh, having some ideas about what should happen, what should not happen things that perhaps could make better sense if there was a classroom perspective in the policy uh, arena. Uh, so instead of complaining about it, that's what really led me to then become an administrator and want to have a, a bigger voice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, little did I know that you know each su successive uh, opportunity would lead to bigger questions, uh, meatier questions, weightier questions, and uh, before you know it, I was a superintendent in San Francisco, and okay, now now it's time to put up or shut up. Uh, so I, I've just been very fortunate. I feel very blessed mm -hmm. that I've had the opportunity to do what I've done. So you've worked in uh, four different districts, uh, in Tucson, in Las Vegas, San Francisco, and now Houston. Yes. Four large systems in the Southwest. Tucson actually is the smallest of those, um, but four large systems in the Southwest. Could you talk a little bit about similarities and differences about those districts and how those similarities and differences affect your leadership work? Sure, so I think you know, that's a question that I've contemplated quite a bit. Uh, I think that if you remove, if you change the faces and you change the names, the issues are the same mm -hmm. because we're talking about urban education. So issues of poverty, issues of disenfranchisement, issues of historically underserved populations, issues of inequity in terms of what we offer our students. Those are common across every community, every school district that I've, that I've been part of. I, I would say that the other similarity is that in America, uh, we, have, we have to come to grips with the fact that we don't treat public education as an investment. Mm -hmm. What we do is we treat it as an expense. It's an expense on a state line item. So as a result, you get in woefully inadequate funding for public education. Uh, and, and I illustrate that as I've gone into the Houston community, where uh, I've given the statistics to, to the community that we spend less than $10,000 
per student to educate students in a public school setting. Mm -hmm. $10,000 per student, yet the very same student in the state of Texas is allocated $134,000 to incarcerate a juvenile youth. So the question really should be, do we invest now or do we most assuredly pay much more later? So it seems to me that uh, you have a, an opportunity, the bully pulpit, if you will, being the leader of a large system. So uh, the San Francisco system in California is not the largest by far, but certainly the city of San Francisco has political influence and power sure. that might outweigh its size, actually. Uh, Houston is an enormous city. Uh, and you would have that opportunity there to, as well. So could you talk a little bit about how you use the institutional power to try to change state policy? You know, that's an interesting, an in interesting perspective because I've, never, because I've never considered myself a superintendent, uh, and, I, and I have plenty of people around me that will chop me down to size if I ever start reading my own press clippings. Uh, I consider myself a teacher. So I still take great joy in going into classrooms and watching the magic that happens in the classroom. And then think about how do we create the conditions for that magic to happen in the classroom. That's my job. But because I'm an English language learner, because I entered the public school system in Tucson only speaking Spanish as a kindergartner, because I get to live my life as a Latino male in a society that doesn't always respect the culture and heritage, of people of color, uh, then I feel that I have a unique platform to speak my truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and because I don't have to run for elected office, I get to speak the truth. Uh, so because of that, I'm just very transparent about what I think and what I feel in my own experience, which uh, permeates everything that I do and I say. I know that in San Francisco, uh, what we were able to do is really form an extraordinary partnership with the mayor of San Francisco and myself as the superintendent of the schools. And together, he and I were able to establish a, a collective impact framework in the city of San Francisco where the voters approved right before I left. He and I led a campaign where the voters of San Francisco approved a 25-year initiative that would set aside a portion of the city's operating budget to serve children and youth and families wow. in San Francisco. That gave us an incredible platform to be able to address issues of poverty, issues of homelessness. It was We were able to provide mental health services and, and medical services services to students. And someone once said to me, you know, you know, Mr. Superintendent, you just can't throw money at the issue. It's not about money. And, and I said to them, you know, I think you're right, but you know, this is my 27th year in education, just one of those years, I wish somebody would have thrown money at the issue. Uh, and here we have really an opportunity to provide the wraparound services that, again, allow the teaching and learning to happen in a classroom. Uh, so that, for me, was very transformative, the power of coming together and the power of collaboration. Uh, and, and that's what, quite frankly, I hope to be able to bring to the city of Houston, the same kind of ethos around a collaborative working environment to serve our, our children and youth. Yeah, it would seem to me that leadership in the public sector uh, requires the, the kind of building of bridges that you're just talking about, mm -hmm. building alliances with other people who have a, a vested interest in the work that you're doing in the, in the students who will be ser served by the schools, that getting those people aligned with your mission and you aligning with them so there's a mutual benefit seems to be an important goal. Absolutely, and in every city that I've, I've had the pleasure of working in, you cannot have, you cannot have a well-functioning or a world-class city if you don't have a, wo a world-class public education system because the very future of the city depends on the students sitting in the classroom right now. Right. So, uh, if I could add, sure. you can't have a world-class city without a world-class university either. I would absolutely <laughs> agree with that. <laughs> and you, you know, if and if this, the university's colors are red and blue, it makes it even even better, more <laughs> more more powerful. <laughs> uh, so, what were your career goals when you came to the U of A? Did you always know you wanted to become an educator? No, I didn't. Um, I actually came to the University of Arizona as an engineering major, and um, I really wasn't the best in mathematics, but uh, at the time, everybody was forecasting that the, the job market of the future was engineering. So, you know, I wanted to be gainfully employed, so I came as an engineering major uh, and struggled, quite frankly. I, I think it was just, a, on many levels, a culture shock. Uh, but I'll tell you, there was an, an incredible program here that m many of my my uh, friends and I took advantage of when we came to the university. It's called the New Start program. Oh yes. And uh, the New Start program really grounded us at the University of Arizona. We felt like we were students. When the fall semester started, we had some units already in our pocket, 
We knew who to talk to. We knew where the advisors were. We knew we 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 ran the place. Uh, so that grounded me here at the university. But uh, you know, working my way through college, I was teaching guitar on the side. I was giving guitar lessons, mm. and I found myself you know struggling with my math courses and my you know you know the the the, the track that I was on academically. But then I found this great joy when I would sit and teach, and I would see the the light in a student's eyes and they couldn't play a G chord and then before you know it they could play a G chord. I felt I felt a sense of accomplishment. I had really the student was learning but I felt so good that I could help them learn. So that's what made me decide I wanted to be a teacher and um, I, I still remember coming to see Dr. Uh, Kathy Escamilla in the College of Education and, and I had known her and, and, and I said I think I want to be a teacher and I remember she said Richard you can't think you want to be a teacher you have to know you want to be a teacher. So I said, well, I want to be a teacher. And so she helped me plan out the rest of my, um, my coursework. Uh, I took a little bit of a scenic route through college, but, you know, I've never looked back. Mm -hmm. Many of us did. There, the, the one thing about a university, and a great university like the University of Arizona, is that the scenic route often produces results that uh, are broader and oh. um, uh, at the same time more focused than being zeroing in on the same thing and just doing that one thing. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Yes, yes, Couldn't yes, agree yes. more. So uh, let's stay with the with the uh, the UA theme for a little bit, since sure. we're, this is the alumni association. Uh, why did you choose the U of A for college? You know, for me, it was never a question. Mm -hmm. uh, the U of A was just for me my stretch university. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't think I was going to be able to get into the U of A. So when um, the Office of Minority Student Affairs at the time, this was back in 1984 when I graduated from high school, and uh, I still remember uh, Michael Celaya, who now works with the Alumni Association. He was a student, but he was also a student recruiter. So Mike spent so much time at Pueblo High School working with us, with our applications, with our FAFSA forms, uh, helping us to try to decide what kind of majors we, we really wanted to get into. And then here he is, uh, a living example of somebody that, I'm a student at the University of Arizona, I can do it, you can do it. Uh, it was for me a no-brainer. I, I knew I wanted to come to the University of Arizona. Ironically, oh, it, was, it was, I still remember this, and I get a little weepy about it, because I remember you know, my parents, uh, never went to college. My mother was a high school graduate. My dad had dropped out at middle school because his brothers were off fighting in the Korean War. Uh, but I still remember my dad got his GED when my brother and I were in high school because he wanted us to know that you could finish school. Mm -hmm. But I remember when my brother and I told him that we were going to college and my brother Ruben at the time was, was thinking of going to another university whose name shall remain nameless. <laughs> About uh, 130 miles away. Yeah, you know, we, we, we cured him really <laughs> quick. But I wanted to come to the University of Arizona. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling my dad that, and, I remember, and my dad was a man of very few words, and I remember my dad saying, well then, you know, you should really think about living on campus. And he knew all about the dorms. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how in the world does my dad know about the dorms? Well, it turns out, being a journeyman sheet metal worker, he had actually worked construction building some of the buildings oh. on campus. Mm -hmm. So I still remember the very first year, which was Parents Weekend. And Ruben and I brought my mom and dad. And um, I just, I, I'll, I'll never forget how emotional that was for us to see my dad on campus, not with his tool belt and his hard hat, but as the parent of a University of Arizona student. Mm -hmm. um, I still get teared up by that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad he lived long enough to see that and to see us both graduate and get degrees. Tell us about some of your memories of the University of Arizona. Wow. Um, you know, I just remember ASUA and the student government and how hard we all worked, but how much fun we all had. Uh, I, I remember um, with great fondness my years working, being a student in the New START program, then being a group leader with New START. Uh, I eventually worked for the Office of Minority Student Affairs doing the same kind of recruiting of high school students that Mike Salaya had done. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I remember that with great fondness going out and working with other students. But I just remembered the vibrant campus life that was um, the University of Arizona. Uh, I still remember the fact, I still remember the time when uh, you could actually be in your dorm room uh, on the night of a U of A basketball game and say, oh, I think we're going to go to the basketball game and walk down to McHale Center and get a ticket and sit pretty close to half court. 
Uh, I remember distant memories. I remember days. those days, <laughs> uh, and you know, soon after that, and the change of coaching, and uh, and then you know, you couldn't you couldn't get tickets, but those were the memories, mm -hmm. and I, I would say probably above all, the the best memory I I have is a time frame when my brother Ruben ran for student body president at the University of Arizona and I was his campaign manager uh, and I felt really good that I was his campaign manager but I didn't know what the heck that meant uh, all I know is I still remember hanging out of a window at one of the dorms uh, hanging a campaign sheet that said vote for Ruben uh, you know, I, I think you know I think uh, I, I think the time for sanctions is over, so I can I can tell this story. We can revoke your degree. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember hanging this banner. He's running for student body president. And I remember us thinking, "There's no way we're going to have a chance to win." And then I remember he won, and I rem that was really for me a seminal moment to show that you know hard work does matter, mm -hmm. integrity does matter, you know being focused really does matter, and uh, that was for me the time period that was the scariest. It was the most. Um, uh, in many ways overwhelming, but mm -hmm. it was just the most fruitful time for me. Um, all of those memories. I had great professors. I learned so much. I left the University of Arizona College of Education breathing fire. I was going to change the world. That's mm -hmm. what I felt. And, and I was going to change the world at my alma mater, at Pueblo High School. Uh, and that all came from my experiences here at the University of Arizona. Wonderful, wonderful. Let's talk a little bit about about education, sure, and about your leadership role in education, um, and this is this is given what you've just said. This 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 came from uh, one of our online viewers. Uh, can you talk about students who are English language learners? How can providers of curriculum support gifted ELL students? So I think one of the things that's happened with uh, and and I was fortunate enough to have this conversation with the president of the United States, where we have to depoliticize the learning of language. Uh, there's an old joke that goes, that goes uh, what do you call someone that speaks three languages? They're trilingual. Two languages, bilingual. Somebody that speaks one language, they're an American. <laughs> so we, we politicize language in, in America in ways that are far outside the realm of the curricular, the curricular area. So I think one of the things that would help and has helped is if we look at language acquisition as a, a, a benefit, a virtue. Mm -hmm. So if a student walks through our campus doors or our classroom doors speaking in a language other than English, we should nurture that language, we should make sure that the language continues to be developed while we also teach English. Mm -hmm. Because we know that the English is the language of, of commerce, it's the language of business, it's the international language. So we have an opportunity to create bilingual, trilingual students. What often is the case that I've seen is that we look at language from a deficit perspective, right. where we say we have to stop that, teach them English, with ne and you negate all of those skill sets that students already have in their primary language. Um, in my experience, when we've actually focused on an assets-based approach to language development, uh, what I've found is that students accelerate. And the literature is very clear about the fact that providing those first language supports, you're able to accelerate learners. Now, the issue of, of um, gifted students uh, is a big topic because we often, and again, here I get on my political horse, I would say that No Child Left Behind had some virtues. It, it, it required us to look beyond the, the, the aggregate number and actually really look at mm -hmm. who are the student groups that are that are being served and not being served. That being aside, the overemphasis in testing and the testing culture, in my very humble opinion, has narrowed our curriculum. Uh, so what ends up happening when you narrow that curriculum is that uh, you, you don't have time right. in the school day for enrichment activities. You don't have time in the school day to actually look at an equity approach to meeting the needs of students and personalizing and individualizing the instruction for students. When that happens, whether they're English language learner students or they're just gifted students, they often get caught in the lurch. Right. So we don't continue to enrich their mm -hmm. experience and continue to accelerate them. So I think the more that we can do to identify student needs from an individualized perspective is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been very, very fortunate to have been in systems that have really tried to embrace that approach. Uh, in San Francisco, we took exactly that approach uh, and we were able to, uh, by the time I left, we were the highest performing large urban school system in California. 
with 38% uh, of our students were English language learners. So we were able to show that this can actually work. Right. Um, but again, it's not something that happens overnight, but it's more of a philosophy that translates into a strategy, which then translates into pedagogy. Right. Well, it's interesting that you talked about the narrowing of the curriculum, that uh, some of the work that I've done showed that the amount of science instruction in elementary schools suffered tremendously under No Child Left Behind. Uh, dropped as much as 50% actually nationally. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time where the national, our, our national policy was to increase STEM education. Sure. So you wind up with a law that has uh, an exactly opposite effect of where, where the national strategy lies. So, you know, there, Absolutely. So being really careful about how policy might affect downstream other important variables, it seems to me a, a critical issue for leadership. Well, right, but that's, ex that's exactly my point, is, is that as a classroom teacher and all of my colleagues that, that are here and listening that are classroom teachers know exactly what I'm talking about. You have so many hours in the day, you have so many minutes per period if you're at the high school level, and yet it's so scripted based on what the accountability is going to mm -hmm. be that you don't pay attention to actually educating a little child. Right. right. So, so if you can amplify the opportunity to really have engaging, enriching classrooms that have technology involved, but also have hands-on discovery learning involved, a mastery-based classroom, uh, I think that's where we need to go. And, and quite frankly, that's one of the reasons that I decided to move into a superintendency or pursue a superintendency role, because I have a pulpit that I can, right. that I can talk about these things. Having been in the classroom for 10 years, uh, I can actually relate to what, what that looks like in the classroom. Right, right. Well, since we're in this vein of, uh, of uh, uh, not necessarily directly political, but we have a, we have a question from one of our uh, viewers, and I want to read that sure. and, and engage in that. And folks here in the audience, uh, please, if you have a question, uh, come up to the mic at some point and, and uh, uh, ask Richard what your question is. So here's the question from an alumnus, uh, Steve. In your time at San Francisco, you seem to have generally positive attitude toward charter schools, even attending the, attending the ribbon cutting ceremony for the first KIPP school in San Francisco. For those of you who don't know, KIPP is a large national charter chain, uh, which began in Houston. We were actually talking about this yesterday. Uh, and now as a superintendent of Houston ISD, where there is a large presence of charters such as KIPP and Yes Prep, could you please share your thoughts on how the public school system and charter schools could collaborate with one another to achieve the best possible outcomes for our children? Great question. So <clears throat> let me give some context. So I mentioned that when I, when I entered, my brother and I entered kindergarten, we were Spanish speakers. Now, my parents were both bilingual. They're both, they were both first generation, uh, so they were bilingual. But they made the conscious decision that my brother and I would be taught Spanish, and they trusted that the public school system would teach us English. Mm -hmm. Now, knowing what I know, think about the incredible amount of faith they put in the public school system to do right <laughs> by their kids. Uh, so because of that experience, were it not for the teachers, were it not for the administrators, the support staff, the, the people in my educational experience, which was a public education in the Tucson Unified School District right here in Tucson, I would have not been able to do the things that I do currently. I, I would be relegated to doing what my dad did, which was an honorable job, but I'd be installing sheet metal on a roof in Tucson. That's what I should be doing mm -hmm. if you follow the narrative. Yes. So because of that, I am an unapologetic, I'm a fervent, unabashed public school champion. Now with that, you often get asked these questions about are you pro-charter or are you anti-charter? I think it's the wrong question. I am fervently, passionately, ravenously pro-good schools, mm -hmm. and I am just the same anti-bad schools. And in my career, I've seen some great public, traditional public schools and some great charter schools, and I've seen some horrible traditional public schools and horrible charter schools. So I think our question should be, what is it that we're trying to accomplish to educate our students? And quite frankly, I think that the charter school movement was created to be able to give us some laboratories Mm -hmm. of where we, can, we, could, we could focus on certain strands. And if you believe and you read the narrative, it's that we would learn from each other. But I think because it's been politicized, and quite frankly, it goes back to the funding issue. Uh, <clears throat> if you don't have enough funding 
to actually provide the adequate experiences for students, then you're going to fight for the pennies. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that many times what we've been what we've uh, been forced to do in public education is we've been relegated to fighting for the pennies and the crumbs, and and it becomes a political fight. Mm -hmm. So I've worked very collaboratively with charter schools and charter school organizations. I've uh, in California, I was part of a collaborative where we had charter school management organization CEOs and superintendents working and learning from each other in a very organic, very very uh, I think honest way. Mm -hmm. And we learned a lot from each other, and we found that many of our challenges were very similar. Uh, but then again, I've also seen where <clears throat> there are some situations where I've seen uh, charter schools that will not do well by their students, where they'll accept students and when it comes time to testing or if students have disabilities, all of a sudden they don't get picked or they don't get enrolled. That's the example of a bad school that, mm -hmm. I, that I'm not supportive of. So my, my, my philosophy is that if we're all about public schools, then let's talk about what we want the outcome to be for our students. And some parents may decide that that environment, for whatever personal reasons, belongs in a, in a charter. Mm -hmm. But most parents, and, and because I'm superintendent of a public, traditional public uh, school district, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to advocate for parents, you can find what you need for your children in our schools. Right. Because if our schools aren't good enough for my children, they, I shouldn't be promoting them for anybody's child. So that's really the, the measure for me. Well, we were talking yesterday about uh, some of the issues having to do with uh, the teacher labor market. And uh, you were in San Francisco. <clears throat> when, when I met you in San Francisco, we were in a restaurant having dinner in a fairly pricey neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I asked you the question, uh, how much do you pay, what salary do you pay a starting teacher? The number, by the way, was much higher than we pay here in Tucson. Um, but my response to you was, how could a teacher afford to live in San Francisco on that salary? So could we move on to this now? Talk a little bit sure. about, about the teaching, teacher labor market. Uh, what sorts of things do you do uh, now in Houston or previously in San Francisco to attract talent, energy, commitment, passion uh, to your teaching force in your schools? Great question. I think it goes back to, to what I, when I mentioned about why I, I decided to be a teacher. I knew that if I went into teaching, uh, I wasn't going to uh, you know, be a millionaire. Uh, but I also knew that I shouldn't have to take a vow of poverty to be a teacher. You're wearing a nice suit, by the way, I should. Thank you. Yeah. You know, got it on sale at uh, Marshall's. <laughs> um, but, but I think this is also the great paradox of, of public education, where we, we have more than ever a greater need for excellent public education systems. Yet, when you think about the, the, the political narrative around teachers and teaching, you know, teachers, for whatever reason, have become the, the new piñata of public education policy. Mm -hmm. Everybody that's running for office comes up and takes a whack at a teacher. Uh, yet, very few have the experience of having been in a classroom and working with students and developing you know, not educating widgets, but educating souls. That's mm -hmm. what you do in a classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that, and because of the fact that I talked about education not being looked at as an investment, but rather as an expense, then, you know, we don't have the ability in public school systems uh, to increase the price that we charge for our widget. We just don't. Mm -hmm. we, we get an allocation. It usually comes from the state. And that's what you have to take care of everything with. So because of that, I think it's important that we prioritize compensation for our educators and that part of the conversation of, 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 of compensation for educators also is a clear delineation of what we expect in terms of practice. Now, once we have a definition of what we expect in terms of practice, then how do we as a system then invest in the educators to continuously develop their professional capacity to meet the needs of the students? Not the students 15 years ago, not the students that you wish you had, the students that you have right now in front of you. That's what we, I think, we should be doing. That's what we've done everywhere I've been. Um, because then you don't have the professional development that is fly-by-night, mm -hmm. right? It's the drive-by professional development that you'll never use again in, in your classroom except for the week after the, the PD. Um, I think that's what makes it important for teachers to feel that they're being supported, that they have a living wage uh, while we're working on increasing wages, uh, but that we create the conditions so that teachers can be successful. Mm -hmm. 
the data that I have uh, in when I was both in Las Vegas and, and in San Francisco and haven't really diff dug into the data in any any real way yet in Houston was that by far teachers that were leaving the profession in, in both of those cities, it was not because of pay. It was because mm -hmm. of working conditions. Yes. They didn't feel that they had the support or they didn't feel that they had the training to be able to meet the challenges they were seeing on a daily basis. So I know that literature, in fact, I know it pretty well, and I agree with you entirely. And one of those factors is uh, school leadership. So as a superintendent, yep. uh, how do you cultivate, what sorts of things do you do to cultivate leadership at the school level and throughout the district to create uh, um, the kind of m momentum toward the goals you've been talking about? Well, I think, you know, you it's, it's like the teacher in the classroom. The teacher in the classroom uh, whether he or she wants to or not, is a role model for the students. So how you react, how you address, how you interact with students gives students a clue as to how they should interact. Same thing as a superintendent. So if I walk around like Tilla the Hun, uh, then it's going to send a certain message to the organization. Uh, my personality and my professional ethos, and just quite frankly the way I was raised, is, is not that. Um, I think that we are in a, in a people business, so we should take care of people. That doesn't mean we lower standards. It doesn't mean we don't have accountability matrices. It doesn't mean that we don't have expectations. But we should treat people like, like people. Because of that, I, I strongly believe that you fire when you hire. So I, as a superintendent in San Francisco, even as a deputy in San Francisco, there was not one, super, one principal, one assistant principal, or one administrator in any kind of capacity that didn't get a final interview with me. And the reason for that was that I, you know, by that point, everybody's resume has been vetted. Uh, we've verified that they're qualified for the position. Some, in some cases, they've had to do a, a sample, a work, a work example. So I know that the vetting has been done. What I'm sitting and having a conversation with people is, do you have the ethos to be part of the organization and the culture we want to create? in yes, this yes, district. Yes. Do we, are you going to be collaborative? Are you going to work well with people? Are you going to give your best self? Are you going to treat people with respect? Are you going to be on the team? And quite frankly, in some cases, after that interview, I've said, you know, not yet. Mm -hmm. So you fire when you hire. And, and I'm really proud of that. And in San Francisco, we were able to really create some strong pathways for leadership to really bubble up through the organizational structure. Houston, I have the same I have the same ethos. It's a, it's a massive system, 216,000 students. Uh, so you can imagine how many administrators we hire. Mm -hmm. uh, but same thing, the final interviews with the superintendent. No script, it's just we're having a conversation. Uh, and at some point, you know. You know, is mm -hmm. this person on board mm -hmm. or not? Mm -hmm. uh, I found the same thing in my job as a dean, that, um, that uh, it, those kinds of interviews with uh, in my case, faculty and department heads and so on, is an opportunity to communicate a set of values and uh, commitments that the organization needs to have. Sure. Uh, and uh, the best way to do that is directly to people through those kinds of conversations, way better than policy edicts. Oh. Which go straight to the circular basket. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, as an alumnus of Pueblo High School, if you were to welcome today's freshman class at Pueblo, what words of wisdom would you offer them? Pueblo High School freshman class. Um, this is a tough one because there's so much I want to say. And I'm a superintendent, so I'm pretty wordy. Um, I'm working on that. Um, I, I think what I would say to students is that this is going to be the transformative part of your life. Uh, so take it all in. Mm -hmm. Try new sports, try new clubs, get involved, meet new people, but just take it in. Mm -hmm. And just remember, because I would assume that if I was at Pueblo, I'd have some kind of a role there, I would also say, and the people that are here are all committed to your success. Mm -hmm. We want you to be successful. So we're going to guide you, we're going to support you, but make no mistake, we're going we're gonna to make sure that you're ready ready for the world when you leave Pueblo High School. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Pueblo High School is not a last choice, it's the first choice. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing mm -hmm. I think is really important. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Well, you know, it seems to me that a lot of uh, youngsters, even here at the university, and even young adults, uh, have a fear of failure. They, don't want, they want to exceed at every single task they do. 
And I tell my staff uh, that, you know, how do I put it? Um, uh, if I haven't made three or four mistakes in a day, I probably haven't done three or four things good in a day. You know, just part of life. And so helping people understand the virtue of mistakes and errors and learning from them uh, is, seems to be an important it's, it's It's part of the learning process, yes. uh, Ron. And I'll tell you, you know, I learned a lot of this when, uh, uh, around this very notion because as educators, we don't have... We don't have the luxury of making mistakes because mm -hmm. we're working with young people, and that's somebody's baby, um, whether they're 18 or they're 8. That's somebody's baby. But my time in San Francisco, I spent a lot of time really cultivating strategic partnerships with the business community. And, and in San Francisco, it's the Mesopotamia of innovation and technology. Yes. So we, you know, I was meeting with Mark Zuckerberg, and I was meeting with Mark Benioff from Salesforce, and all of these leaders. And one of the things that they always talked about was this culture of innovation. And as you really unpeeled the culture of innovation, they were very, very transparent in that for every innovative idea, they expect nine out of 10 of those ideas to fail. And this was ubiquitous and consistent across everybody I talked to. So there's almost this expectation that you're going to have unsuccessful ideas. And it's okay because it's part of the learning process. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, how far away are we from that kind of a, you know, unbridled thinking, innovating, dreaming stage where we can just try things out. Mm -hmm. uh, some more parameters because of who we work with. But I thought if we can create that kind of an innovative culture, then we can actually do some really mm -hmm. cool stuff. And we did some cool stuff. I'll share with you later, yeah. but good stuff. Well, one of the things that it seems to me, going back to your comment about No Child Left Behind, is that if the goal is to have 100% correct on all the exams, then error making is something to avoid. Right. Um, and not the best way of uh, approaching innovation. It's, it's, I think it's stifling. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, what's, what's uh, ironic is that our students are engaging in that very innovative process all the time, except when they're in school, mm -hmm. most of the time. Yes. Because they're on their devices and they're trying new things and they're trying new games and then they're, they're communicating across you know, cities. And they're, they're innovating and thinking and collaborating all the time, yet you walk into the schoolhouse door, not here, of course, <laughs> but you walk into the schoolhouse door and people say, put it away, mm -hmm. turn it off, mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it. And in some places, we're going to suspend you because you have it out. That doesn't nurture what we say we want. Right, right, right. So uh, we have another question from one of our viewers. As an accomplished educator yourself now, can you reflect on any of the best teachers or professors you had you were, when you were in school or college? Wow, okay. So Angelina's going to get me in trouble because once you start down that road, you're going to forget somebody or not mention <laughs> someone, right? <clears throat> so I apologize to all of those that I do not mention, uh, but I'm going to start with, with the immediate. I've mentioned Mike Celaya, and mm -hmm. I know he's going to be tremendously embarrassed. Mike was transformative. He was one of us. He was like the older brother, and he guided many of us to uh, apply to the University of Arizona and believe that we could do it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm really excited Mike is still affiliated with the University of Arizona. Uh, but I have somebody here in the, in the live audience who I, I had, I'm blessed that I had the opportunity to say this to her in person. But my sophomore honors English teacher is here, Helen Rosen. And the reason I mention <laughs> Helen is that as an English language learner, I always... I always felt that I couldn't really write, or was I writing, or was I really able to do what I could do? And I remember that when I took her honors sophomore course at Pueblo High School, and she was a tough grader, and everybody knew she was a tough grader. Uh, and she was, she was a tough grader. Uh, and I still remember getting one of my, um, it wasn't the first, but it must have been the second or third major writing assignment back. And uh, Ms. Rosen always took the time to confer with students. She never just gave you your paper. She always, you always came to her desk. She would give you the paper and tell you a, a thing or two about what you can do to improve. And I remember that in my sophomore year, she said to me, you should think about going to law school. You write really well. You make a good argument. And then she gave me my paper, and I went back to my seat. That was transformative to me because no one in school had ever told me that, mm -hmm. had ever said you could be a lawyer much less you should go to college. So it was truly transformative, and I'm really blessed I got to tell her that today. She was one of those teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also have, but I also have the, the, the remarkable opportunity here at the University of Arizona to really study, I think, at the, the knee of masters, uh, Adalberto Guerrero, 
who was my Spanish teacher, and, and, and you know, I was bilingual, but you never know how really unbilingual you are until you start <laughs> studying the language. Uh, he was remarkable, and many of the strategies that I used uh, as a teacher myself directly came from what he modeled in my methods courses. Uh, Richard Reese, may he rest in peace, was incredibly um, powerful in my thinking about policy and thinking in a, in a cognitively different way about policy and, and, and teaching and learning. Um, I also had the opportunity to, to study with Macario Saldate, Gini Fuentevilla. Um, I mean, the list could go on and on. Um, so I had incredible, incredible teachers here at the University of Arizona um, that I, I'm just very grateful for. Uh, so those are just a few. And a very august list, if I, <laughs> if I might uh, add. Um, so do you have any advice on how to raise parent engagement in, uh, uh, the question says in low socioeconomic schools, but mm -hmm. this, is a, this is an issue that goes across all schools that, that has not affected just particular kinds of schools, but yeah. how do you engage the, the community, parents, uh, in, in our effort to educate our children? So parent engagement, mm -hmm. I don't believe in it. You have to elaborate. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think parent engagement is such a low bar because mm -hmm. I can engage a parent in two seconds flat. Mm -hmm. uh, let a parent who's applied to a magnet school in my district not get that magnet school placement, I guarantee you they're going to be engaged. Uh, have a student that's going to be suspended from school, I guarantee you they're engaged. Uh, have a student that uh, wants to take a class and they can't take that course and they have to go somewhere else, I guarantee you parents are going to get engaged. Parents get engaged over and over in public schools, in schools, often. So engaging parents isn't really an issue. Mm -hmm. What's I think, what I think we should be really looking at is a parent empowerment. Mm -hmm. And the reason we should be looking at empowerment versus engagement is that when you think about what students get and who's, who's, who's privileged, if you will, but who is served in the public school system, it's a student who has parents who are knowledgeable about policies, who are knowledgeable about what the rules of the game are, who are knowledgeable of how to apply for programs, are knowledgeable about what their students should know when they leave the second grade and go to the third grade. Oh, my students should know certain things so that they're ready to go into the third grade. Or the parent that knows that if I'm going to test my student for a gate program, I know where to access those, those forms. I know how to access. And if I don't get admitted, I know what my recourse is. Mm -hmm. I know where to do my appeal and who to contact. Contact. See, that knowledge is empowerment. Mm -hmm. So what I've advocated for, uh, you know, in, in, in the districts where I've had a leadership role is I don't want to talk about engagement. I don't want to see the list of parents that showed up for parent night, right? Because we expect you have a night, parents are going to come, or at least some of them are going to come. Mm -hmm. But what's much more important for me is how are you empowering parents by giving them knowledge? How are you empowering parents by explaining what you're doing in your classroom so that parents can truly be partners in whatever way they can? Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. parents may have the, the subject matter knowledge to be able to help you with your long, you know, long division. Some parents may be just after they get back from their second job say, okay, mijo, show me what you're going to do today because I know you have homework tomorrow because a teacher told me you have homework. You're turning in. Let me see it. Mm -hmm. That's an empowered parent. They may not know all the details, but they're empowered because they know there's homework. The homework is worth the grade, and the grade is the ticket to the next step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my thing is creating transparent, very, very parent-friendly ways of educating parents so that they can be advocates for their children. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we really should be talking about empowerment rather than just engagement. Nice answer. Hey, <laughs> thanks. But potentially threatening. Sure. Because some people in positions of authority, I was going to say in education, but it's everywhere. It's, not, it's in military, it's in, in religious organizations, it's in the private sector, uh, don't want to share that power. Uh, be, you know, they want to keep it to themselves. So sure. being open and, and willing to uh, have powerful parents is potentially a risk for some people. Sure. And listen, as a superintendent, believe me, every board meeting I've, get, I've got some very empowered parents <laughs> <clears throat> that have very, very distinct points of view. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, could we please diversify who they are? Mm -hmm. Could we make it so it's not just the, you know, the, the usual suspects that come? You know, that tells me that there are 
parents that are empowered, and that's great. Mm -hmm. I want all my parents to be empowered because I believe so strongly in what we're doing and what we're trying to do for our students that an empowered parent is going to be my biggest advocate, is mm -hmm. going to be our biggest advocate because they understand where we're going. They understand what the delimitations might be to what we're trying to do, um, but they have a voice and they have an articulated voice. So in your answer just now, you mentioned diversity, and Alejandro asked this question. Can you talk about the importance of diversity in the field of education, and what can the College of Education do regarding diversity? Well, I think diversity is critically important, and, you know, it, 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 all you have to do is look at the, the demographic profile for, the, for America to understand that we are truly a land of immigrants and we are, diverse, we are a diverse nation. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the opportunity about three years ago uh, four years ago to uh, be on a, on a trip to China for four, five cities in China with a group of five urban superintendents and we were, we were visiting but we were signing inter, international agreements for teachers and students etc. So I had a chance to walk classrooms in China for seven days and invariably and without exception the one thing that every Chinese educator that I spoke to, every Chinese leader that I spoke to outside of the official meeting mm -hmm. was we love the diversity of America. That's why we want our kids to go to America for college because it's diverse and because there's creativity and there's innovation. Now could, could students in China do long division like nobody's business? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But what they couldn't necessarily do and what these teachers said was we want them to be creative mm -hmm. and we want them to think and not be told what they had to do. So you can only get that kind of an environment if you have a diverse environment where you have differing points of view. Uh, and for me, it's critically important that students like myself see people in the classroom, teachers, administrators that look like me. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, as a student, you know, I had the great fortune of having uh, Robert Acuna, who was the principal when I was at Pueblo, and Richard Gastelum. Dickie Gastelum was a dean of students, and when I came back as a teacher, Dick Gastelum was my principal. Mm -hmm. uh, and even to this day, when, when I do come back to Tucson and I see some of my former students, they say, you know, I remember thinking, well, if he could do it, I can do it. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the point. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's important for kids to see role models that look like themselves other than the stereotypical role model mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. see on TV, right? The thief, the gangbanger, the whatever. I think kids are so pummeled with these images that come from social media and come from the popular culture mm -hmm. that I think there has to be some way of mitigating that, and I think diversity is one of the ways that we, mm -hmm. we can do that. Mm -hmm. That being said, I know for a fact that we create environments in classrooms that are either culturally welcoming or culturally off-putting. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some really good research about that in, in, in northern Arizona with the Native American Indian tribes and, and how students, you create certain environments and something that you, you don't even know that you're doing can off-put a student. Uh, so when I, when, I, when I talk about um, implicit bias training, uh-oh, he's going, he's going there, he's mm -hmm. talking about implicit bias training. No, it's very simple. There are things that we do because of who we are and how we grew up and once we know how that affects others that live with us, then it's not saying you're bad. All it's saying is you've got to be conscious of mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. And once you're conscious of it, you can do something about it. It's like the gas tank. If I get into my car today and I'm driving and it's on empty, I don't say to myself, oh, I'm a horrible owner. What am I doing? No, I need gas, so I'm going to stop putting gas. Same mm -hmm. thing. So I think diversity is critically important. More and more, I will say it's also critically important socio-emotionally the diversity that we have in our classrooms. LGBTQ youth, the highest rate of suicide uh, tendencies it, when I was in San Francisco were LGBTQ youth who just did not feel that they had a safe spot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I know that it's very politicized and it gets into the moral and religious and I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in what do we do to create safe environments for our students because I don't want to lose a student and I don't want a student not to come to school because they feel they, they don't feel comfortable. Right. So diversity in all of its senses, all of the permutation, all of the facets, I think are incredibly important for us to pay attention to if we're going to have a public school system mm -hmm. that serves truly the public. Right, right. So that was an interesting story you just told about your trip to China. Mm -hmm. If I could go back sure. to that for a minute. Uh, I also have made my obligatory trips to China. I think all American educators have to make two trips now 
They have to go to China and they have to go to Finland. Finland. I haven't actually gone to Finland, so I'm, I, I have a demerit there. <laughs> um, but I've been to China many times now. And I remember going on a trip um, to northern China, to uh, um, actually Xi'an, where the, the terracotta warriors are. Sure. Wonderful city in uh, northwest China. And we were trotted around to these really incredible schools. And I had this wonderful conversation with elementary age kids. They must have been eight or nine. Uh, they were in uh, a, an English school, uh, uh, English language school. So the medium instruction was English. They spoke English beautifully. And they were delightful kids. Uh, then we went to a high school. We saw a lesson um, about the seasons. And, oh, that's a really good lesson. 70 kids in the classroom and one teacher. <clears throat> and it was a very engaged lesson. 70, by the way. <clears throat> 70, yes, 7-0. Seven yeah. A very engaged lesson. Then the next day we went to a high school. We saw the very same lesson. Oh, what kind of staging went into this trip, right? So we see the same lesson. It was dreadful. The very same lesson, no student engagement. It was just dull, rote work. So uh, we got in the bus and we talked about that on the way back to our hotel. And then the next day it was time to depart. And like many trips in China, you have uh, you have a, a, a somebody from the from the Communist Party with you on the trip all sure. the time. And the member for the Communist Party um, comes to the hotel in the morning at six o'clock in the morning, and we're all thinking, why has he come to six o'clock in the morning? And he pulls me aside and he says, uh, he spoke enough English to do this. He said, you know what you saw in the high school yesterday? He said, what did you think about that teaching? I said, I thought it was pretty dreadful. And he said, yes, it was dreadful. He says, and that's why you're here. We want to try to figure out how we can have a system that engages children the way American K-12 education engages children. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was very illuminating to me because they don't want to copy our testing system. They've had no. it since the Confucian sure. movement, right? Right. So they, they want the liveliness, the engagement that our system has. The engagement. And I'll tell you something else that I learned because we're talking about our trip was that in, in America, we have the notion, at least we articulate the notion, that we want to educate all children. In, in China, they're pretty clear. Not everyone's going to get an education. Mm -hmm. And some are, you know, we need street, street cleaners. Uh, and I'm not talking bad about China. It was a wonderful mm -hmm. and great trip. But sure enough, 24 hours a day, there's somebody sweeping a street. Yes. So there are roles, and we don't have that ethos. Mm -hmm. We say everybody deserves a free and public uh, education. And so I think that's another huge issue that I think we should embrace because it's, it's part of who we are as a, as, as a democracy. So we have uh, this changing one more time. Oh, there was a question. If you could w walk up to the mic, please. Richard, a couple of minutes ago, you used the word pummel, and Ron, you just used the word testing. And we really haven't gotten your thoughts, Richard, about all of the national testing where the students and the teachers feel pummeled. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Thank you. So <clears throat> a, couple, a couple of thoughts. Um, first and foremost, uh, it was mentioned in my introduction that I... I was a, I'm the past chair of the Council of the Great City Schools, the 70 largest urban school systems in America. Uh, and we asked ourselves this question about three years ago. So uh, last year, we self -anal uh, did a self-analysis in each one of us, our districts, of what is the testing that is happening in our district. We looked at everything from, from federal requirements to state requirements to self-imposed requirements. We even took it into account the ACT, the SAT, the PSAT. Every conceivable test that we were doing, we categorized it and we self-reported. And what we found was that that was really the genesis of a national conversation on testing. If you remember last year, President Obama and Secretary Duncan uh, had a press conference where they talk, talked about testing and, well, guess who started that conversation? So with that said, I think that this whole issue of testing derives specifically from this over-reliance on simple indicators to know whether students are doing well. Uh, people don't want to take the time to understand the progression that a student has made. They want to know a number or they want a letter grade. So is this an A school, a B school, a C school? Well, it's not that easy because if you have a student that comes into a school reading at the seventh, at the high school, seventh grade level, and by the end of the freshman year, that student is now reading at a ninth grade level, they're moving into 10th grade, think about that, they've done three grades <laughs> in one year. That's incredible progress. 
yet that's not given credit if there's an arbitrary line of proficiency that is set which all students must, must meet. I think that there's an over-reliance in making it too simple and not giving credence to the fact that learning and teaching is an incredibly complex endeavor uh, and you're working with students and you're working with people. That being said, I try to define what I mean by this uh, in terms of testing and in terms of assessment. I'm all for assessment multiple times, all the time, all day long because assessment is that information that a teacher can use to re-engage, to recommit, to intervene. It's your diagnosis of whether students are learning what you think they're learning or not. It's real-time data. Uh, testing is for a particular purpose. So you have to take the SAT test for the purpose of going to college, right? Once you take the SAT, you can take it again, but there's not really much you can do once you've taken the SAT. So Doug Reeves used to talk about the difference between a physical exam and a, an autopsy. An assessment's a physical exam. You continue to understand and learn and you can do something about it. A test is, a, is an autopsy. There's nothing you can do. You've given it, you've done it, it's done. So I think that if, if we as an education community can get clearer about that, I think we can actually start changing the narrative. And that's the big challenge that I've laid out in Houston already. Is, I'll, I'll give you one little example. I know we're running out of time. But I've been on this teaching, this uh, listen and learning tour in Houston. So I've been in literally every corner of Houston over the last six weeks, every night of the week. And invariably, I get asked about these, 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 these questions. But in every occasion where I've gone to these, uh, these events, the community has been wonderful. They have the marching band. They have the cheerleaders. They have the singers. It's beautiful. So as I get asked this question, I've asked the community, so how many of you like that band that just played? Oh, everybody claps. How many of you like those cheerleaders? Oh, everybody claps. How about that choir? Oh, everybody's clapped. Everybody's excited. I said, are they good? Yes. How do you know? I said, where's the test to tell me that they actually did a good job, right? There are some things that you cannot test. And I would say that those things that you cannot test are the very things that make it fun for kids to come to school, mm -hmm. keep them engaged, and make it possible for them to learn. Richard, it's been a great conversation. Uh, much of the public conversation about education over the last 30 or 40 years in our country has been about how bad our system is. I think they're dead wrong. I think we have a great system. Our vibrant democracy, it's a little crazy right now, but our vibrant democracy, <laughs> Our economy, our ability to recover from the recession is a, is a signal, is an indication of the quality of education that we provide tens if not hundreds of millions of people in this country every, every year. Uh, the leadership of that system is also under attack all the time. But I think you are evidence, untested evidence, so you, I don't have a test here, <laughs> but you are evidence that um, American education has a, has a good future that Thank with you. leadership like you, um, I wish you could uh, come back to Tucson. And maybe in the next couple of years, we can get you back here and uh, as a leader of one of our school systems here. Thank uh, you. But at any rate, uh, it's been great talking with you. It's been uh, wonderful learning from you. And I'm sure that the children and parents and the, the city fathers of Houston are just really um, very, very pleased that they hired you for their school. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. And, and I'm incredibly honored that, you know, as a proud Wildcat, that I would be invited to spend a few minutes with you and with our Wildcat brothers and sisters just talking shop. Uh, I'm incredibly honored. So thank you. You're welcome. And thank you very much. Thanks. Mm -hmm.